Welcome, everyone, to Music Junkies, a podcast about people sharing extraordinary stories about how music has impacted their lives. Welcome, everyone, to Music Junkies. I'm your host, Annette Smith, and our guest today is a great friend of mine, and her name is Susan. So I love Susan so much. Beautiful, beautiful lady, wife, mother, grandma, right? And if you guys don't know, I don't know if she would show you, but she does have the most unbelievable ass I've ever seen <laughs> in Calgary. Honestly, 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 honestly. Way to go, Brian. Way to go. So welcome, Susan, to Music Junkies. Thanks for joining us today. You're welcome, I think. <laughs> So before we get started, I wanted, you know, <laughs> I wanted to ask you what your process was going through, obviously collecting all the songs and everything. Just for my, my listeners know, Susan um, literally gave me a list and then pretty much did my podcast for me. I would literally just read everything, which was awesome. I love that about her is that she likes to have everything organized and what's going to go on. So she's made my job like super easy today. So I appreciate that, Susan. Welcome. But anyways, how was the experience putting everything together? It was interesting because I went back to when I realized music was significant in my life. My background's in music. I have a music degree and that almost knocked the love of music out of me, just dissecting it so much. But over the years, you know, the mindset work that we've done and brain research that I've done, I, it, I, it, underscored for me how important music is in people's lives and how it affects them and how certain markers in their life are are um are um, i don't know they become significant because of a piece of music or a piece of music has been at, at, at a significant time in their life and so i just went through that and i thought okay what was important to me at this age this age this age and that's why I, that's how i put the list together yeah i love that because you're absolutely right i think that um, for whatever reason, whatever happens in our life, I do believe that there's some form of a song or we've heard something and it just kind of ingrains that into us. So it does, when we hear that song, it brings us back to that memory. And that's so powerful of the brain and, and how that can actually do that. Right. So it's awesome. So I wanted to jump right into your very first song today. Um, I love this song, by the way, and it's totally you. It was funny. Tyler and I were driving out to the property this weekend. And I'm, I love this process. I say it all the time, but I do. I absolutely love this process of people sending me their playlists and I get to listen to them and I get to really just kind of feel the type of person they are. And I loved your playlist. It was like two and a half hours long and we actually had to go to Fort McLeod. So it was perfect. We had a playlist to listen to the whole way there. And Tyler's like, yeah, this song is totally Susan. This song is totally Susan. It was, yeah, it was awesome. So this song is totally you, but this is where we will start. And uh, this is Nancy Sternacha, right? These boots are made for walking. <laughs> I, before you tell me why you love that song, did you have a pair of those boots and a little short dress that you wore? Yeah, it was go-go boots days, the original go-go boots days. And no, I didn't have any. My family couldn't afford much at that point in our lives. We were just starting to get uh, my dad's business going. So, But I was in grade five, and it was my first 45. It was the very first 45, a record of any kind that I ever had. And that was on one side. Nancy Sinatra was on one side. These boots are made for walk. And the other side was her singing with her dad, uh, something stupid. I know I stand in line until you think. Anyway, these boots are made for walking. And uh, there was a peer group that I had um, going through school. I think it started about grade four when we started to become aware. And some of them turned into mean girls just because they were trying to find their way in the world. And, and I, I kind of, I was not the most popular person. And there were two Susans and the other one was more popular. She's more beautiful. The guys were all over her at grade five. And, and I just felt diminished a little bit by all of that. I was trying to find my way in the pecking order, which took a number of years. Um, but I remember that song and I'm thinking, these boots are made for walking and that's just what I'm going to do. And so, you know, I, I look at the playlist and I thought that was the beginning 
of me determining where I'm going to go in my life. And I, I think I look back on it now. It was a great start. <laughs> it was yeah. a great start. So obviously talking about going back into school. So was this more like, like grade five is more elementary. Did you feel like you came into your own in high school? What kind of person were you in high school? Did you kind of have that just growing up in school? Um, I was different because I took piano lessons and um, my parents were immigrants. They were German. So at some point in this, you know, it got better in the 60s. But, you know, my parents had an accident and I didn't even know it. But it was it was just getting accepted by the community for that. Um, you know, my mom used to say, I'm not letting your hair grow long. We're not putting it in braids. Sorry about the braids. But we're not going to make you look like an immigrant. We're not going to cook with garlic. And so it was it was uh, trying to find my place. And who I was and um, I, I'd say it's you know I don't think it started till after I was in after I was out of university but as a program process of going through a bunch of experiences um, to get there and there was a whole bunch of things that led me to what I did after university and was teaching instrumental high school music jazz band concert band all that stuff um, that's when I, I got into my own I would say it was after university yeah I think a lot of people can relate to that as well, right? I think elementary is just there and, you know, high school, you're like trying a whole bunch of different things and seeing what works and seeing what doesn't, but you're still a follower. I feel like you're still a follower in high school yeah. and then in university, because most of the time, most of us do go to university alone. So we get to restart, right? We're like, oh, I can be anybody that I want to be. I don't have to be this prep or this rocker or this goth person or whatever I was in high school. I can kind of come into my own. And I think a lot of people do go into university like that. So this next song that I'm going to play, um, Susan, again, haven't heard it for a long time. But I'm a believer, right? The monkeys. Yeah. Tell a little bit about that song and what it means to you. Oh, I used to watch that. It was a series. It was on TV every Saturday, and I used to watch it faithfully because uh, I thought the guys were cute, and they were kind of the sequel to the to the um, the Beatles in in my listening. But as a, when the Beatles were on, I was a little bit too young to appreciate the power that those guys had in the world, and the Monkees were kind of an offshoot of that, and some pretty good singer songwriters actually. Um, but their antics and how they had fun in life and all that kind of stuff, and the I'm a believer is kind of a, the next step to these boots are made for walking and I'm a believer uh, even though it was about um, it was about a love story which they all are I did I didn't really take it that way I took it more from the power point of it and the aff affirmation part of it as a kid you know I grew up in a neighborhood with seven boys uh, there were two girls there one was writing out recipe cards for her dowry when we were like 10 years old and I was like not, not me and the other one was uh, sitting in the, in their house with all the blinds pulled and smoking with her mom watching soap operas. And I'm like, nah, that's not me either. So hanging out with the guys was how I, I got to it. And they would do anything. We did really crazy, crazy stuff uh, and very physical. And we had a band as well with uh, plywood guitars. And the Monkees was part of that too. So, yeah, that's where it fit. <laughs> so that little core group of friends that you hung out with, those boys, what was the craziest thing you guys ever did together? Oh, my God. We did so many things. Craziest thing we ever did. Uh, there was a we there was a show on TV at the time called Combat, and it was a military show. It was a pretty serious drama, and we decided to dig a, a, a hole, like a foxhole, in the back, uh, in the field behind uh, our house, and it was huge. I mean, we dug for all summer, and then we'd lay in there and and just pretend and do stuff like that and nearby there was a cornfield there's a lot of corn and corn in those days was super tall they've shortened the the dna on that now so it can grow more ears and less green but anyway we used to go in the cornfield and we'd knock knock it down and that would be our running through the fields of whatever combat zone we were in and we'd make forts and tunnels out there you know and eventually the farmer would go out there and go what the hell happened to my cornfield <laughs> what happened here and one time we had an encounter with this huge huge snapping turtle and we didn't realize 
I don't know where it came from because there wasn't water nearby. I don't know what, I don't know. There was an irrigation ditch, but that was a ways that turtle traveled. And all of a sudden it ended up at the edge of the cornfield and in our combat zone. And we were poking at it with a hockey stick and we were pretty fun, having fun with it till it bit the end of the hockey stick off. And then we're like, oh shit, right? <laughs> and got a parent <laughs> and then got a parent. So yeah, that was pretty funny. It was crazy stuff. So <laughs> how many times did you play doctor with all these seven boys? Oh no, we didn't. We didn't hurt ourselves like that. Well, one guy got his tooth caught in a basketball net one time and pulled it out. But other than that, <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, date any of these boys mm-hmm. growing up? Like as you were growing up? No, none of them. Uh, two were my brothers, so that was that. Okay, two of the next day. The other guy, no, he was into the into the girly girls. But actually what happened is they were good friends and uh when it came to grade 12 and i didn't have a prom date um i turned to one of them who also didn't have a prom date and another friend and i said hey why don't the three of us go together so the three of us went to prom together yeah yeah my girlfriends too it was nice yeah this next song is one of tyler's favorites so it's nice to see it on your playlist as well so ccr right proud mary how can you not love that song? Yeah, I mean, I just picture uh, Cher uh, just standing up like, and just kicking it, like she was just kicking it. And I just, it was a strong woman image for me. It was a super strong woman image for me. And it left a good job in the city, working for the man every night and day, you know, uh, just getting rid of that. And I didn't understand that in my life. Like my dad was a business owner and, uh, and, and we struggled uh, for a lot of years and then became successful, like very successful. But when I, uh, I didn't realize that that was going to be my image. And, and it was interesting because my husband reminds me every once in a while, like, you know, Susan, you intimidate people. And I'm like, oh, well, maybe they should actually get a t-shirt. Like if that bothers you, you know, get over it kind of thing. But then I realized I had to be more gracious than that. But it was about that posturing because I was tired of not being in the in crowd all the time and always feeling like I was left out. I just said, nah, I'm going to be myself. And, uh, and left a good job in the city is what I ended up doing, you know, 10 years ago, started my own company. Yeah. So where do you think your strength comes from? My mom. Yeah. My mom and dad were fighters. Uh, They lost, my dad lost everything in Europe twice. He was a five-year-old being chased by the war. And, uh, and my mom uh, ended up in my mom's hometown. And uh, they went through a lot with the war, and, and they were right in Germany in the thick of it. As a matter of fact, at the end of the war, they hid my dad because the uh, British wanted to castrate all the young men. And so they hid my dad until the Americans could show up and the Brits would not be so angry. So there was a whole bunch of stuff. And then when they came to Canada, you know, to have a German accent in the 50s was not cool. I grew up in a small town, and there were a lot of people there who lost brothers sist- and, and uncles and dads in the war killed by Germans. And the irony was that half of my family was prisoner of war in Germany because they were Canadian soldiers and the other half was running away from the Canadians and the Americans. So it was kind of a, it was a crazy time. And, uh, you know, that whole uh, Arbeit macht frei, you know, work makes you free that was over the death camps was also something they used to preach to my parents when they were teenagers because there was no economy in Europe and Germany was all smashed to hell so there was nothing there. They had no gold, they had no economy, all they had is their work ethic. So when my parents came to Canada, that's what they taught us. Like, I, I often wanted to just hang out with people on Saturday and I think that was one of the reasons I didn't get to because they knew so many times I had to say no because I was working for my dad or you know washing the truck, hosing things down, cleaning out the garage, all the stuff he needed to do to keep his business running fell on me so the work ethic was there um if anything i think we kind of maybe i carried it too hard and i needed to learn to have fun so that's why i'm glad i met you annette (laughs) (laughs) do you have any brothers or sisters are you the only child uh, no, I was the oldest, okay. which was another problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had a brother who was 18 months younger than me. He passed away a couple of years ago of leukemia. I still have a younger brother. He's five years younger than me. He's a successful business owner in, uh, in Ontario. Yeah. Were you guys really close gr- growing up? Like because of living in a, you know, kind of coming from Germany and living in that 
you know, back home and then coming and all being together and not knowing anybody. Did you guys, did you feel like you protected each other? Uh, a little bit, a little bit, but actually my brother and I, my brothers and I were more Canadian than we were German. I mean, we only spoke German to my grandparents at home. Everything was English and there was not really a lot of ethnic except for some of the food. Um, but then we got, you know, we get, we were very Canadian. I mean, we assimilated very, very well. My dad was a blue G or a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, even though we lived 30 minutes from Detroit. He was determined to be, you know, a big deal Canadian. And so, no, I, I guess it was interesting. The three of us all went kind of different ways. Um, even though we grew up in the same household, we had turned out to be quite different, similar, but quite different. Yeah. Yeah. What is your favorite childhood memory, would you say, as a family? When I was um, when I was fourteen, uh, my dad uh, was building a house for this man who had a summer cottage in northern Ontario, um, and he told my dad that if Dad finished it before the May long weekend when he went up to the cottage, um, that he would give my dad a free vacation and the whole family. And so my dad worked real hard because we again we we're getting to a place where we finally had some cash. But it was a free holiday, so Dad worked hard to finish that up, and we ended up, and they had a beautiful, uh, large log home, almost like a, it was almost like the size of a of a main uh, main cap main uh, place of a resort. Anyway, and those people were amazing. They took us fishing. I learned how to fish. I learned how to uh, peel birch bark off a tree and make canoes out of it and all kinds of stuff. Wow. We learned a whole bunch of things and they were so patient with us and uh, they were older people and they kind of mentored us as, as kids on, on cool things to do in the woods and uh, you know I had a lot of energy and then a year later my dad went uh, back up north in northern Ontario with those folks to look for a place of our own and bought it when I was 14, 14 or 14. 15 maybe they bought it when I was 14 15 and that was a place we went every year uh, as often as we could sometimes only for long long weekends uh, sometimes for a week at a time but there was a lot happened there a lot of growing up learning to fish hanging out with my dad trolling in a boat um, just all blueberries and blueberry pies and swimming and jumping off the rocks and stuff like that that was those are probably my best memories yeah I love hearing stuff like that that, you know, when I was growing up, my grandparents owned a fishing resort and those were my best summers ever was to just get away and, and, you know, be, be with my grandparents and yeah. in that environment. So I am grateful that we now have that, you know, we started later on in life, you know, being able to do that for our kids now, but they're, they're young adults and we get to go and do that for them now. So it's, I love that you said that. I, you know, I think that's really what keeps a family together is like forcing them to go away from their friends yeah. being in the woods together and, you know, and just kind of just building that family unit. And I love that you said that. I, I wish more families would go and do that, get their kids off their, their cell phones. And, yeah. and my kids remember that because when they were little, they got to go to that same cottage with my parents. Well, Brian and I were doing grad school in San Diego, so we farmed them off to Ontario for, for three summers. Yeah. And very, very close to my parents. And um, and and uh, like my, my dad was amazing with sharp knives and filleting fish and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's how our son became a surgeon. One of them. <laughs> We're certainly not medical. I don't do blood or any pain. Um, so I think he got it from my dad that way. But they also have said to me, both of them independently, obviously they don't live at home anymore, but they uh, they both said, look, you know, don't buy us any stuff. We don't want stuff. We want to have experiences. We want to do stuff together. So uh, we've started doing that with our daughter. It's been fun. Our son is finally through medical school and every all that stuff, finally. And uh yeah, just excited to go spend some time with his kids and with us and hanging out. Yeah, looking forward to it. So this next song, right? American Woman. Oh, Sue. I feel like you have a good story. Yeah, it's a good one. So two things. One, uh, Nancy Sinatra, These Boots Are Made For Walking, was my first 45. Uh, American Woman, The Guess Who, was my first LP. 
Uh, it was my very first one. I got it when I was in grade nine. High school started in grade nine. And uh, that American woman, like I lived on the border of Canada, US, very close. And again, another really strong female song. And the guests who were Canadian. So I was proud to have that Canadian element of music that finally showed up after the monkeys. And then also uh, that's that strong, there was a whole bunch of songs on that album. Pretty much every song on that album is important to me, but that's the, the headliner. So that's the name I put out there. And there's memories behind all of them. But the craziest thing was when I met my husband and uh, we were dating and, and I saw his record collection, he had it as well. And the crazy thing is it was Brian's first LP as well. No way. <laughs> we have two copies, his and mine from back in the day. Yeah. That's awesome. So how long have you and Brian been married for? Uh, <laughs> I have to think how old my kids are. So uh, August... August 5th, it'll be, uh, no, August 6th, sorry, it'll be uh, 38 years. 38 years. 38, yeah. Crazy, 38. So what is, what are two things that you absolutely love about Brian? How he connects with people. Uh, he's really, really good at connecting with people. And how... Um, how he's able to take connecting with people and his intense connection with music and and um, just make that come alive for people. So he works with people on their signature sound as singer-songwriters, but he also works with Parkinson's people who are out of flow. Um, Parkinson's takes you out of that. Everything, their speech, their gait, everything becomes jerky. And he works, he's been working with Parkinson's people since about 2008 or nine or something like that on, in a Parkinson's choir and uses their coming of age songs like My American Woman, but theirs. Um, and for girls, it's about 14, age 14. For guys, it's about 15, 16. And when he brings that music back and talks about their memories, kind of like what we're doing, it gets them back in flow and it's magic. It's magic. And so he's doing it by Zoom now, but when he was doing it live, you could actually get them striding around the room again and wow. being slow. It's, it's magic. Um, there's something about the brain that takes you, when it takes you back there. So I'm glad you're doing this because that's how important it is to people. Yeah, so Brian's really good at pulling all that together. Yeah. So who, who pursued who? Did he go after you or did you go after him? Uh, he pers well, it was we had an interesting conversation in the music faculty lobby after a rehearsal. So there were there was two hour rehearsals twice a week, and I don't even know if we were in the same ensemble at the time. I think he was doing choral stuff, and I was in a in a large symphonic band at the time. But anyway, we ended up in the lobby. He had broken up with a girlfriend. I didn't have a boyfriend either at the time, and we just started talking right and became friends and then he invited me to the gala the music gala and you know you get all dressed up and uh and i said well as long as we go as friends i don't want a relationship we're just going to go as friends and then afterwards he made some moves and i said whoa whoa i thought we were just going to be friends and uh yeah he continued it progressed from there okay so we're at the gala night he made some moves how long did he seal the deal with Susan Farrell? How many dates? Uh, it's interesting. It was probably about a year. Really? You made it work for it. That year, and then I broke up with him because there was somebody else that I wanted to explore. And one of my friends who was friends with this other person I wanted to explore realized, A, that other guy was married and he didn't tell anyone, and B, that he was a real schmuck. And so my friend who looked like a leprechaun, he's another music guy from Prince Edward Island, and, and he protected me because he knew the other guy uh, well that I, I didn't know. And basically told the other guy, like, if you touch her, I'll, I'll beat the pulp out of you, right? Because, yeah, she doesn't know all this about you. Eventually, uh, I went back to Brian, and we moved out west, and... Uh, <laughs> it was funny because he was dragging his feet out here. We were out here for a year and a bit, and I just said, hey, you know, I'm 27 now. We've been dating for, no, 25. We've been dating for a bit, you know, either like shit or get off the pot. Like either it's going somewhere or it's not. So again, we 
stopped seeing each other for a few weeks, and then uh, we went to Vancouver to buy music, sheet music and all that for, for school, and uh, went out for lunch, and, and he had a ring. No way. Then we got off the pot. <laughs> Amazing. So you have two beautiful children. What is yes. the most craziest thing that you've ever did for your kids? You did anything like extreme, like have they gotten in trouble and you're like, uh, uh-uh, uh, nobody's talking to my kids like that. Have you ever, you know, you're a uh, woman. I know I have some s- stories. The thing I've ever done for my kids. We did so many things for our kids, you know, I mean, crazy stuff. I don't know. I can't think of a, I can't think of a crazy thing. I don't know. Uh, we were like, we we're all about the kids because we had no family in Calgary. It was just them and us. Uh, and a few and some friends but it was just them and us so for me it was you know (sighs) crazy stuff it doesn't have to be crazy you know some people do extreme stuff for love and some people do extreme stuff for their kids where they want them to be successful that they sacrifice i mean they're always sacrificing for these yeah it was that i mean he was a hockey playing violinist that was expensive yeah Um, we were teachers at the time. I mean, we just didn't have the income. And our daughter was an actor, singer, dancer, and also started out on violin and then switched to piano. And so doing all of that, I mean, it was expensive. At one point, I figured out we were spending like 20 grand a year in the 80s and 90s just to do our kids' activities. So it was hard to save for university. But truly, they never wasted any money. We we always said to them, you know, be the best you can be. We always not push them, but try to inspire them and challenge them uh, to be the best that they could. And Ryan ended up being a total anomaly. Like he was a hockey playing violinist, a high level classical violinist. So some hockey teams auctioned him off for uh, people to buy him to play soirees and parties at their houses because he could also Celtic fiddle like nobody's business. And uh, other teams we didn't bother telling because it was not cool to be a violinist. That was some you know, not normal thing. In our house, we have a Detroit Red Wing shrine in one of our rooms, and we both have music degrees, so music and hockey, it's a thing, right? Yeah. And with uh, Lauren, it was always, I was, uh, she's a good-looking woman, and at the, and she used to ask me at bedtime, like, Mom, you know, am I pretty? And I go, yeah, Laura, you are, you're beautiful. Uh, inside and out because she's very intuitive connected to people person but I said that's not good enough you got to be smart or people will not take you seriously and so for her you know the suck it up princess line was normal and one time she was begging at me uh, crying over the phone when she moved to New York about whatever I can't even remember what she was having her 20s angst about but I was quiet and then she she kept going and finally she stopped talking and she said so and I said, well, you know, if you don't like the job, you can quit. And I was dead silent. And all of a sudden she goes, nice reverse psychology, mom. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, now she's an executive producer at Netflix. So she sucked it up a lot. Yeah, it's awesome. I love that. So you were an encouraging but a strong mother. Yeah, life's not easy. Uh, I wanted them to enjoy what they do, but I also didn't want them to dabble because then they'd only do surface work and they'd never get the fulfillment of having done something and worked hard and having accomplished something. Yeah, I agree. So this next song is this the real life? Rhapsody, right? Some Queen. Is this just the- yeah. Yeah. Bohemian Rhapsody was a big deal. Um, when uh, when they did that, they amalgamated nonsensical classical and pop music and the power of that in front of all these people at Wembley Stadium uh, when someone's dying, uh, the singer was dying, was just incredibly powerful. It was like a turning point for me where I could understand where pop music came from classical roots. Um, yeah, and I had a few exposures to that, but that was in university when we were having to analyze all this classical music, and and, and I was like, oh, you're killing me. And then 
I so that I couldn't even really enjoy it anymore. Um, and then when this pop version of it showed up, it was like, okay, everybody can get this, everybody can understand it. And it's a stacked eight part harmony, like it's eight different things happening, eight different singers happening at once, even though there wasn't eight of them, but they overlaid the tracks and they figured out how to do that. But the, the harmonies were lush, beautiful, amazing. And, and I think it exposed a lot of people to a side of classical music that they maybe thought it was accessible to them. Yeah. So that was, that's, that was cool. Yeah. So Susan, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you want to live? Oh, wow. Anywhere. You can so still do what you're doing. That would never change, but just anywhere in the world. Do you have to stay there for 12 months or can I go like a few months? <laughs> you can go wherever you want. Um, you know, I love Maui. Uh, I love Wailea in Maui. That is like a, an amazing place for me. Um, the other places I, I would, I love spending time with our daughter in New York in that space and uh, experiencing everything that's there. And we've been really lucky. Ryan was in Chicago for nine years. So that's a whole, people say, you know, do you like Chicago or New York better? They're not the same. They're totally different experiences. So had a blast in, in Chicago. And now he's moved to Columbus, Ohio, and uh, it's right on the Bourbon Trail. And there's a ton of, you know, it's right near Cleveland uh, where they have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So there's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to be able to explore there. So I'm excited to do that. I would love to have a place and live in San Diego for part of the year. Uh, I like Calgary. This is home. But... Um, yeah, San Diego would be a cool place. And then I, st I still want to tour Europe. I think we would have done it by now, except for COVID. But our son-in-law is from Turkey, so he took us there summer of 2019 for almost a month. And we got to feel what that country's like from the inside out. And I just really want to go back and do that in a lot of places. So I don't really want to stay in one place for 12 months. I want to be all over the place. Yeah. I'm the same way. I feel like I haven't went and bought or purchased any property anywhere else because I don't know where I want to end up because I'd love to just kind of go and embrace that area and, and really find out, you know, what would be, I need to be somewhere warm. I know that I got that yeah. one down. It needs to be warm. <laughs> and that's why I, I picked San Diego because you can go there all months of the year. It's not too hot in the summer. We did grad school there. There's an amazing stuff going on. It's on the ocean. It's a family town. And I want to be, have a place where, like, same as in Calgary, where we live now on the acreage, I, I want it, both places to be a place where my kids and my grandkids want to come. Yeah, I agree. This next song, right, Don't Stop. Sleep with Matt. Hello. Yeah, I'm connected. Yeah, that's, go ahead. I just, I absolutely love Fleetwood Mac. Like, I just, I, I love it. I actually just bought the rumors LP the other day, like, I, was like, I need yeah. a record, what record? And there was just like, boom, the universe said, you need this record. And I, I haven't heard that cause I had it as a tape, but I hadn't heard, I haven't really heard the whole thing again in a long time. So cracked a ball of wine and listened to that. And it was just like, it was magical. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I bought that album in during university, um, and it was like I didn't know where I was going to end up. I, as a kid, I, I, I loved architecture, and I used to draw out our house, like where I was going to grow up, and all that stuff, and and design a home. And and in university, as I started finishing school and had to grow up and be, I was like, now where am I gonna? Yeah, you know, so don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Like, where are we going? And Brian and I ended up moving out to Calgary, and. Um, and uh, Fleetwood Mac was about that. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. What's next? What's next? And where can you go and be and do? And so Calgary's given us many blessings, including WFG, the company I work with now. Um, so many blessings from that. And and so every time I go on stage, that's my song. When they say, what's your song? It's don't stop thinking about tomorrow because I'm going to live to 100. That's the plan. Taking care of myself as best I can and getting on keto lately. Oh, this no sugar thing is really working. <laughs> It's working me and it's working. Um, and so that that was that one's kind of followed me throughout my life. Um, and then that, that's one of the things about Maui, like um, Fleetwood has a, a, a restaurant there and we go there when when we're in Maui. It's just around the around the way at uh, 
I don't know if I'm going to say it right. La hit, la loop. Blah, 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 start to an L. Anyway, that's where it is. Um, and uh, yeah, it brings me back. Yeah, it's a great place. Would you say you're a good singer, Susan? No. No, not a good singer. If you. <laughs> My, my husband tells me Nasal Kale, which is my maiden name. He goes, you're nasal. And I'm like, and he goes, support your job. So no, I, I was a singer because uh, when you're a piano player in university, you have to be in a large ensemble. And so piano players get stuck in initially grade one. Uh, in first year, they call it broad squad, which is the girls choir because there's so many piano players. So it's all girls. And then you make your way through other choirs. And when I knew I was going to be a high school mu uh, instrumental music teacher, I worked my way through my percussionist boyfriend into the band side and got out of choir because I was just not a great singer. I love to sing. I have a big voice, but it's not trained. Yeah. What your, what's your go-to karaoke song if you had to get up there and karaoke? Um, I think it's that Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, Stevie Nicks is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Okay, this next one, I've never heard it. Birdland. Yeah. I think it's from your jazz years, right? Yeah. I could see a lot of jazz hands with this one. Yeah. Um, when I was in university, uh, even prior, in high school, there was a man in my hometown, small town, he coached my brothers in hockey, and I was in love with his son at the time. Uh, son didn't know it, never really knew it, married somebody else. Uh, but um, he taught me a lot about the big band era and Stan Kenton and Maynard Ferguson and all those guys. And I started to follow that. And then I met a fellow in grade 12 who was big into jazz music. And we both ended up, we dated for a bit, we both ended up at the same music school uh, at Western University of Western Ontario or Western University in London. And, uh, and he was big into jazz. And so I started to get more and more into it. He was a drummer. Uh, and Birdland was a huge one. It was, uh, I just love the rhythm. Ba -dum -ba, ba -dum -ba. There's, a lot, uh, 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 uh. There's a lot of laid back, punchy hits and that, that laid back thing. I loved that. Only <laughs> to know that when I started teaching high school music, uh, that was one of the big pieces that uh, helped us win the nationals. So it was pretty cool. What was yeah. your best concert you've ever been to or favorite concert you've ever been to? You've just explored so much music. Yeah. So there's a couple. One, uh, Sarah McLaughlin, her husband, ex-husband now, was the drummer in that jazz band that won the Nationals. So I, the one concert they did here in Calgary at Jack Singer Hall was like just heartstrings and then we did the Lilith Fair tour with them and where I was running backstage one time and ran almost full blown into Bonnie Ray with this flying red hair it was like <gasps> scary stuff my husband did the same thing went around flying backstage one time because we could and he almost ran into Sting which you're not supposed to look him in the eye and Brian said hey my name's Brian how are you right so we had some interesting things with Sarah and then I think the favorite concert where I knew no one uh, was uh, the Rolling Stones up um, what was it called zip code tour post something like that in uh, in Buffalo New York a few years ago that was awesome yeah yeah so you're obviously expo exposed to music a lot because what Brian does and then obviously your background yeah. um, did he ever did he ever pull you out of any kind of comfort zone that you were in with in the music with music because obviously you came from a music background he came from a music background. You guys never like recorded a song together or you never no. a piece of music together or thought about it. I think we pulled each other out of our comfort zones as we were trying to get expert in our field. And it was really important to us that kids always experienced excellence and know how to go from zero to amazing and to give them experiences where they would they would have access to the best. So I was not a trombone player. I was a keyboard player, but I brought in trumpet and trombone and sax players who were amazing, who had accomplished a lot in their life that these kids could look up to and also learn way more technical details than I could ever teach. I learned to play them all at about a grade six level, but 
uh, grade six like conservatory level, but but not to the refined performance level. So we constantly pushed each other that way. Um, Brian went more into musical theater and Broadway, which I didn't know much about, and I ended up producing a bunch of his shows, uh, and he did a whole bunch of those. So he did Carnegie Hall a couple of times too. So there was we push each other like that. Um, yeah, on the professional side more and on the mindset side. Yeah. So obviously being married for 38 years, <laughs> what, uh, how do you keep your spicing up your sex life there? 38 years. <laughs> that one I'm going to pass on. <laughs> I interview Ryan. He's going to totally share that with me. He's going to. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so this next song, Susan, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. Right, some Billy Joel, Piano Man. You said that you just love anything by Billy Joel, so I thought I would put that song on. And just like, why do you love Billy Joel so much? Well, because Brian, because Brian is the Piano Man. My husband is the Piano Man. He could give a rat's ass about a his truck, his Jeep. His I hate riding in it because it's a disgusting mess. But he, he'll throw his canoe on top, he'll go down the river and doesn't even clean off the crud on the tires if he's been spinning in mud. Like, he just doesn't care about the vehicle. But if you put anything on his grand piano, he loses his mind. And so um, he is the piano man. If you've heard him play, he's passionate about it. And so we got into all things Billy Joel in uh, in our marriage, in the early years of our marriage. It was, a, it was an important thing, and Billy Joel was a big deal. We have ended up meeting with him because the guy I grew up next door to, there's a family of seven guys, uh, seven, well, six guys and one girl, and those that, I didn't hang out with those guys, but it was another all guy thing, and uh, they were big into really innovative uh, productions of uh, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, or bringing the Moscow Circus to North America, but Bob, who was a year older than me, ended up um, being the main um, stage manager guy for Billy Joel and Bruce Springsteen, and so I got exposed to Billy Joel live many 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 times plus that was brian's favorite thing so any but anything by billy joel yeah anything yeah i agree i love billy joel what would be your two biggest pet peeves about <laughs> just anything life people most of the time people like you know they don't like loud chewers or oh pet peeves yeah You got to have some pet peeves, Susan. So I am very detail oriented. Like I, when I pick something out of the pantry, I put it back in the same place or within, you know, it's organized. Yeah. Brian's global. He sees the entire forest and not the trees or even the bark. So he takes something and has no idea where he got it from and puts it, he's better, but tends to put things in random places that I can never find again or leaves shoes like he's got three pairs of moccasins right now they each have a purpose but none of them are ever put away and i'll get up in the middle of the night not turn the light on so i don't wake him up and trip over a pair of moccasins because they're in the middle of the room somewhere right so that's a huge pet peeve of mine but i've learned to let go because what what does it matter in life if i trip over his moccasin or he puts something back in the wrong place it's not the end of the world but it still bugs me <laughs> i just don't voice it uh, other pet peeves is when um, I think you know we both with, with, work with the same company. I think it's when people underestimate what they're capable of. Uh, that really bothers me. And trying to help them develop mindset, although it's not my job to fix people, yeah. um, but I do get f frustrated when I know what potential people have and they're not living it. Uh, they were created by, and I'm a Christian, they were created by greatness, and so they have greatness in them, and it, it may die in them if they don't step up. And I, I'm, I'm proud that my kids have allowed that greatness to flourish and, and that my husband and I continue to learn and grow. Um, and if that's my legacy, that's great. Um, but I, I think so many people have it in them, and they just are not letting it out for one reason or another and it's not a peeve it's it's a sadness for me actually I yeah agree, Susan. so this is our last song which is crazy are you ready yeah, go 100 years five for fighting 
I thought this would be a good ending song. I just feel like this has a really good story mm -hmm. behind it. Because you want me to cry right now, right? <laughs> so, five for fighting. Um, my kids were in high school when this came out, and uh, Ryan was uh, small for his size, so he was always challenged to make the team. He was almost always the last cut or the last one kept. And the year he made it onto a city champ team and was an integral part of that, Brian, Ryan was a huge dressing room guy. Like He helped the team win in the dressing room before they hit the ice. And, and a lot of times I think that's why they kept him. But um, when they won the city champs, this was the, you know, the whole thing. Like, I know this was the beginning of a successful life for him. And, uh, you know, it talks about the years going by. Um, I hope that my legacy for him would be something memorable. And I was excited about where he was going. So that was part of that. Um, and also I could see that Lauren was headed down a path where she was going to continue to, to grow and be successful. And I remember when she was in university, she called me. It was super challenging because in she was in a drama faculty and uh, uh, even though she got in, she made the cut from 800 down to 12 or 15, they continue to cut that 12 or 15 end of first year, end of second year. So tons of pressure. Um, and I remember one time we're calling and saying, you know, mom, I just realized that these kids in first and second year university don't have a dream. They're just living for the day and they have no dream about where they want to get to or be. And that, um, she said, you know, I remember back in grade three, four, I was the only kid, I was proud because I was the only kid in grade three, four with a dream uh, because we promoted that. And so this five, that, um, yeah, that song, uh, 100 Years, is always about where am I going to be, what's what's my dream, right? And so I think it's keeping the dream alive. That's what that song is about. Yeah, it's a great song. Yeah. Uh, just for you know, Susan, you're an incredible mother, right? Incredible mother. Um, I look up to you a lot. Like, I, I absolutely, a thousand percent look up to you a lot. So I appreciate it. Um, but our last question, um, just because you've had some life experiences, and I just wanted to, you to give some advice to somebody that maybe is listening right now, maybe going through a challenging time, or maybe you could say something to your 20-year-old self or your 30-year-old self, some kind of lesson that you've learned to maybe help somebody else. I think realizing that you have it in, it in you to do whatever you want to do and that you have to stop doubting yourself. You have to stop listening to the ego, which wants to hold you back. It wants, it, uh, the ego is based in the past and it's people who are say things to you that make you go back to the past and it doesn't want you to move forward and no like i said you have greatness in you you were born that way without limits but take them off any that have been put on you take them off and just go for it because you can be super significant in the people's lives you can make an impact and you can make a lot of money if you want but you can also give away a lot of money if you want to things that are important to you and then you can you have the option to just uh, be fully present. You know, my kids have called me on that lately. They said, "Then when you come to uh, visit us this time, are you going to work?" Which I when my <laughs> my German work ethic gets carried over, they're like, "Yeah, don't work this time." And I, they both said it to me independently. So what I want to say is also, in your striving for greatness and being the best version of you, just remember to have fun. And that's why I hang around with Annette because she forces. <laughs> get out of that Susan Farrell focus groove and just have some fun. So I so appreciate you asking me to talk today because it, it really helped me to think about the music in my life and, and the thread that was there. It was crazy because I never thought about that before. So thanks very much, Annette. And uh, I'm working on that big ass. I'm on keto right now. So we'll see where it goes. Hopefully it goes away. <laughs> Don't get rid of that. Thank you so much, Susan, for joining us on Music Junkies today. It was awesome, incredible. Um, I know that this is just the first one. The next one we're going to do in live in person yeah. because you have so much, so much information on the music side of things. And I just know that you just would bring tons of value. So again, thank you so much, Susan. You are very welcome. Thanks a million.